Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar with Dr. Tom Tolley. Welcome, Dr. Tolley. Well, hello, Laura. How are you doing from, from beautiful South Louisiana? Nice. Yes, been... yes. Uh, beautiful uh, time of year down here. The magnolias are blooming, and you can, you know, a lot of things. Uh, uh, nice, nice uh, floral smell in the air. So, oh, that's awesome. And a lot yeah. of, I, I've been noticing a lot of, um, baby birds like kind of making a little chirping for, for like the crows the baby the baby crows are hilarious because they look like adult crows and they just look like they're an adult crow making all this loud like yeah. and i don't think people realize is that a baby crow is like i mean not when it's out of the nest is almost the size of a regular crow so they just looks like a regular crow going crazy <laughs> yes 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 the parents have a lot to deal with Yes. I know, and we've seen them uh, through our wildlife hospital over the years. So, but yeah, there's a lot of little baby birds out there. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. at least in, in this part of the country. But I hear in the you know the the, the northeast that it's it's uh, still pretty chilly. So, uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the sunnier weather brings brings it earlier <laughs> or makes it. Earlier. Yeah, exactly. So great to to be back and looking forward to to. Yeah, uh, having uh, great attendee uh, questions and and learning a lot today. You know, oh yeah, I can't the, wait. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the the companion uh, bird world here. That is right. Well, wait for um. Uh, oh, I had a question. So, um, you know, when you how many medicate like at a ballpark figure, how many um like medications are prescribed to birds like parrots like pet birds. If you had uh, to give it a number, would there be a number? How many? Yeah, like is it's it... just in, um, you know, it would in your be your prescription book, is it? <laughs> well, I, I mean, because there's so many different illnesses and, and uh, disease conditions that you have to treat and supportive uh, things, but I would say you're looking in the hundreds, you know, into the yeah. thousand you know, uh, different medications, but, but, uh, it, because you look at, um, I can tell you like the, uh, physician's desk reference, which is, uh, the, the, the book that they, they published at one point, I'm, uh, hopefully it's online to save a lot of trees, but when they published it, it was, uh, a oh book, gosh. I don't know, if I, if I even have one, it would be, um, I used to, but um, nonetheless, it was about, you know, about this thick and, you know, and, and it, it, and that was the, the, what it was, was the list of drugs and it wasn't all just a list of them, but it gave what, uh, and I've talked about it on, on some of the the different uh, webinars where it gives what the drug is and what it's compound and it describes it. Um, and then it gives what the uh, indications for prescribing the drug are. And then of course, the long list of side effects. Of uh, yeah, drugs. yeah. And so, so, but uh, it was a very voluminous uh, book. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, I'd say hundreds of drugs that uh, are possible that over the course of a day worldwide are, are prescribed to birds for any different uh, presentations on that. Okay. I was out, the reason I was asking is I'm um, uh, looking at some of the pres uh, prescription drugs, um, like the side effects. I think some of them are so like, um, for, for humans, it's like, you know, can cause like, um, uh, like anxiety or, or, um, hyper, hyper sensitive, uh, hyperness. And, and I was wondering if when you prescribe something to a bird, uh, you, like, is it like what owners all of a sudden notice, like, oh my gosh, my bird is like, uh, showing anxiety all of a sudden, or, <laughs> but aside from like the hormonal, you know, like repressing drugs. Well, you, you know, I'll, I'll tell like you some crazy, like, a... <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 it's true. And I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a great subject and, and, and one that all of our, you know, attendees uh, to the webinar, I mean, to start off with, because you do have situations where you have birds that are, are prescribed medication 
uh, for any different number of reasons. And I've mentioned that you usually prescribe a medication um, and, and this is with the owner's, of course, uh, approval uh, because the owner makes the final call uh, on the recommendation of the doctor. And so <clears throat> there's a recommendation and it's indicated that uh, this needs to be given. And the criteria in my, my you know, for me uh, personally is when the good outweighs the bad. Mm. Okay. Because it's, it's, uh, and I always uh, give the, uh, uh, so, so to give people a reference, chemotherapy. Uh, is there a lot of bad that you've heard about with chemotherapy and you wonder why anybody would even do that? Yeah. yeah. And that's because the good outweighs all of that bad in that person's mind. Uh, and that's the recommendation. Well, what can you do? What can you do to treat this? Well, we have this, but guess what? This is what is associated with it. Do you really want to do it? Yeah. You know, but that's all we have. And you uh, people say, well, yeah, that's what I'll, I'm willing to go through that. And so that goes all the way down, not to that level, but you do have that in, in, in other uh, uh, medications, even antibiotics. Mm. And, and so uh, that's what uh, uh, we look at very careful. I don't want to provide any medication uh, that is unnecessary and uh, because of the side effects and it, it, it's, and it's not good for the overall general health of the bird. Uh, but we do have problems uh, or challenges, I would say, as, as veterinarians treating birds, uh, because uh, each bird is a different species uh, in, in a sense. Uh, 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 blue and gold macaw is a different uh, species than a, a scarlet macaw. You go into different genus and species, you have different orders, uh, ducks, and so it's not like you're treating different breeds like you would be treating uh, one chicken breed and another chicken breed, but you're still in the gallus gallus. It's still the, the genus and species is the same, but we have different and they can react differently in, in to the point of like you have a raptor species and then you have another one, uh, a parrot. And so that's the challenge that we face where a drug may work well with one species and, and not with another. So uh, we do the best we can. We use the scientific information we have. And then we ask, and, and, and a lot of times we don't have that ba um, backup. So this is where we get to your point. When you get a bird and you say, well, I'm given the medication, you look for a treatment response, a positive treatment response. So you're giving it and the bird has nasal discharge, a runny nose, and then you give them the medication and you go like, well, it's gone. It worked, you yeah. see. And so you look for that. But if you're given the medication and you for the runny nose and the bird goes, boom, <laughs> you know, not necessarily that dramatic, but it just starts acting differently or, you know, can't perch or what have you. If you see any of these, uh, any abnormalities, and we always mention that to the owner behavior, uh, physical ability, eating, interaction, vocalization. If there's any changes, then immediately stop and then, you know, call us and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, because uh, we're basing our, our treatments on what is, what is published, may not be published for that kakariki. You know, we don't know. Uh, that uh, because uh, there's not a lot of kakariki research going on and we can go into different species of birds. So um, when you when you give a medication, we're looking for that treatment response or lack thereof. If it isn't getting better, then we need to reassess. But this is a uh, significant um, uh, part of getting a bird well okay and if the medication isn't being given then the bird will not get better that is a fact 
okay? And so uh, that's why we have to try to make sure that when we do prescribe medication, that we can give, you know, uh, uh, that the, the, uh, the owner can give the medication at the appropriate dose for the appropriate length of time to give us the best chance of a successful outcome. There right. you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes. But that, ask. yeah, good. That's good. I have a, a question. It's, um, let's see, it is kind of a, it, it is, um, does it have a, okay, it's about a rooster. Um, so the question I have for you about the rooster is, uh, Recently lost our beautiful silver lace Wyandotte, Wyandotte, sorry, rooster? Wyandotte, yeah. Wyandotte rooster that appeared to be Merrick. Uh, I did some reading and unusual to, uh, they thought it was found it to be rare to be an adult poultry because he's eight years old. So they keep their chickens and parrots. Um, there's never, uh, separate, there's never contact. They have an a aviary and a dog yard that's fenced off. So they're mm. concerned about the potential for cross-contamination. And um, it looks like they're they're doing all that they can. They they wear outdoor shoes versus indoor shoes. They wash their hands. So they just want to know um, your take on that. Okay. Well, that's a that's a good question because um, a, a number of people do have backyard poultry and um, uh, laying hens, and then they also have uh, parrots. Uh, the the as it relates to Merrick's disease, this is a common disease condition in chickens, and it is one of the uh, only diseases in which in poultry production medicine that the, the birds are vaccinated, um, either in the shell or, or uh, in one day of age. And so uh, the birds in production medicine are vaccinated, and it, you're correct, it does usually affect birds that are uh, uh, young birds, uh, uh, one year of age or in, in that, that uh, uh, range or a little less. And so, uh, but it doesn't mean that older birds cannot uh, have this condition, uh, but it's a viral disease. And as far as, again, as far as uh, parrots are concerned, um, or pa uh, uh, passerine birds, if you have finches, canaries, um, this isn't a, a disease that, uh, uh, that we see uh, these birds uh, uh, become infected with. Uh, so so uh, there's no worries there. Um, I do, uh, it, it is very common in unvaccinated chickens. Uh, and so I always recommend that anybody who's looking to um, get birds, uh, uh, backyard birds, uh, laying hens, uh, to try to get vaccinated birds, birds that are vaccinated for Merrick's disease. Um, and those, those birds are available. Um, the yeah, let's see. Um, and so was that the, was that basically the uh, the question? Now, the one thing I wanted to make, and I got that I remembered my point. It was an eight-year-old bird, and yeah. you said it had signs similar to Merrick's disease. It did not say that it was definitively diagnosed as Merrick's disease. So there are disease conditions. And so you say signs similar to Merrick's disease. And so what's the most common clinical sign associated with Merrick's disease? Well, it affects the, the disease itself, affects uh, uh, body system on, uh, in nerves on one side of the body. And usually it's the large nerve in the leg uh, that, that uh, is affected. So they can use one leg well, but they become lame and they can't use the other leg to the point where they can't stand up on it because it, uh, it in infects that, uh, that nerve in the leg. And so with that, uh, the birds just can't stand up on one leg. A chicken can't stand up on one leg. And so that's usually the most common clinical sign associated with Merrick's disease. However, there are other things that can cause the bird to become lame in one leg or not use it. So then the, the, you know, it gets back to that question, 
was it definitively diagnosed because it's outside of the normal range. And in medicine, you know, there's no guarantees in it in, 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 in a virus. Well, it's it's uh, over a year. I can't can't infect it, you know. Um, and so uh, but it would be unlikely. But uh, but if they definitively diagnosed it, there you have it. But uh, again, just because it looks like it doesn't necessarily mean that it was. But it does give us a chance to talk about marriage disease. You don't have to worry about your parent species um, and uh, get vaccinated birds. How about that? All right. Oops. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a question about an African gray that um, diagnosed uh, via x-ray and blood work uh, with arterial uh, sclerosis. The blood mm -hmm. work came back with uh, triglycerides normal and slightly high cholesterol. Um, so they're having symptoms. Um, that are seizure-like um, in one leg, suddenly curling up and then useless and then falling in the cage and opposite eye closing, confusion. Um, mm -hmm. They say that they doesn't know uh, where he is or me, um, followed by hours of deep sleep. So medication for the past month is 1.5, um, is it milli, mm, milli, milli, milligram? Well, it's, it's probably milligrams, probably milligrams is okay. what. Of it, it, I saw I saw Zuxprite ring twice daily, and they're still having the symptoms. So, is it the right diagnosis and is it the right treatment plan? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I, um, kind of getting a second opinion here, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, as far as um, this is good. Now, how old is this African gray? Oh, um, hmm. Does not say maybe we'll wait on a little bit more info for that um but uh not sure yet but yeah I'll find it out while you're answering well, well um one of the um one of the uh oh, 21 years old sorry Congo African gray. it's not a <clears throat> it's not a extremely old african gray and and again my my uh the, the average life of a African gray, uh, 30 to 40 for me. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, um, at, at 21, uh, and then we found with atherosclerosis or um, what we, uh, when you have uh, plaque buildup uh, within the arteries, that's, that's what we're looking at in the blood vessels um, that, that this, this buildup or clogging, if you want, clogging of the uh, the arteries uh, um, that this can occur in in younger birds on, uh, but um, you know, on and it can be related to diet, just in and um, uh, that they're they're being fed, and it can and occur uh, rather quickly, as we we've, we've shown in research. Um, with high cholesterol diets. So that's why nutrition is, is so important to, uh, for us and, and for the birds too, uh, because uh, this uh, disease condition can, can occur uh, rather quickly or over time. And you want to make sure that you, you uh, uh, address that. So the, 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 one of the interesting questions is that <clears throat> was this the 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 correct diagnosis? And well, I'll have to leave that to to the diagnostic test results and and in your veterinarian. And I would say that it is entirely plausible that this is a uh, a correct diagnosis. Um, the 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 problem that that we run into is that um, uh, you know what what is the uh, uh, you know, the treatment and, and how effective can the treatment be. And the problem that we have with, with atherosclerosis, and I will tell everybody who's attending that this is one of our biggest uh, or our most common disease conditions in older birds. And because we're taking care of our birds uh, and we have better nutrition, the birds are living longer. But as, as we all know, atherosclerosis or the clogging of the arteries is a geriatric disease condition. And so 
you know, it, you live longer and you have the ability to live longer, but it's not if it will occur, it will occur and how, how you know, and so this is similar with our parrot species. When we get birds that are over 20, but especially medium-sized parrots in the 30 to 40 range, um, they are probably going to have it in some species, just like some, <clears throat> you know, genetically in, in, in humans are more susceptible than others. Um, and African greys and Amazon parrots uh, in particular are, are, uh, are common uh, patients with this condition as they get older. And <clears throat> so what, you know, as far as uh, diagnosing, it's difficult to diagnose because in humans, what you do is you put in, and many people may be familiar that you use contrast material and that they will, uh, and, and in humans, they look at the, mainly the heart arteries, the heart arteries or the arteries, the coronary arteries on the heart. In birds, these may be affected, but the ones that are the most problematic are the large vessels coming out of the heart. And even the aorta and the large, you know, the large artery coming out of the heart that kind of supplies the blood to the body. And, and that is significant when that aorta and is, is, is not being able to get that blood from the heart to, to, to uh, you know, uh, have uh, give the uh, oxygen to the, the cells in the body. And so this is, this is problematic. Um, an understatement. And, and so, so what they do is they put this dye in the, <clears throat> in the bloodstream and then they take uh, uh, images of it to see, and then they can look at it and say, oh, look, that artery's blocked. We need to put a stent in it. We need to do uh, something like uh, 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 bypass surgery. Well, that's what they could do in humans, but we're talking about birds here that weigh less than uh, a pound. Uh, way less than two pounds. Uh, you know, uh, we're talking avian, so we're having uh, birds that are 500 grams. We may have birds, uh, you know, an African gray who have 400 grams. Um, and so we don't have the the, the technology to uh, at this time to be able to put the dye in and look for uh, arterial. Uh, where the the inside of the vessel is is uh, reduced in size, okay, and 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 so then it's how how do we diagnose it uh, outside of doing a, a necropsy at the end? But we want to know before the patient dies so we can have it live for a long time if we can treat it and know what we are treating. So. Uh, Sometimes CT imaging can help. Uh, uh, also, what can help is an, uh, the radiographs. If there is enough uh, blockage in those arteries, and if it's calcified, it can become mineralized. And you, I think you've probably heard this in humans. And that will highlight, and you can see it more evident in the, uh, the, in the image. So that's what you could you could look at the 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 and then what what you you have is like I said then you uh, anticipate uh, or you you put the the information together and uh, you say well it's having seizure like activity um, birds can have strokes um, uh, and and uh, and then you're saying then it can't use its legs and when we call this claudication and and you say well what's that it's like where you have a a reduced diameter to these blood vessels because of this blockage and so when the bird gets excited that the blood pressure of the bird rises. And so there's more pressure uh, for that blood to flow through, but it can't go through the little bitty holes because it's trying to get in and the more pressure. And so then what happens to the legs, the bird can't use them. 
because there's no blood going enough blood there to actually get the oxygen. And so that explains why you can have blockage and have seizure activity, and you can have a disuse of the legs because some people will say, well, don't you just have a heart attack and die? You don't like, I don't see people like uh, walking around and like just falling down because of uh, high, uh, you know, uh, seizure activity due to atherosclerosis. So I, 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 I extended a little bit longer on this question because everybody should know about it because this is one of the most common diseases that we see in older birds and birds are living longer. So you, you need to be aware of it. The problem is, is you get to, uh, I think that you said isoxaprine uh, was uh, uh, the um, uh, drug, but you have some cardiovascular drugs that you can use to, uh, you know, depending on, on what, what is involved. Um, usually I'll consult with a cardiologist uh, to try to see every case is a little bit different um, if we need to use the drugs and, and, and that's, that's the one thing. And I, and I'm going to trust your veterinarian. It seems like they have a, a, a good overview, an excellent overview on this case to try to die, uh, to, to take the, uh, use the diagnostic tests that are available and to try to make a decision on that. But, um, when, when you have these cases, you have to try to determine uh, the patient's overall condition and what you're able to, uh, uh, information you're able to get through uh, evaluating that heart and the condition of the bird itself to, to see if uh, what drugs and if any drugs would be uh, effective in, in uh, treating the disease process. So um, it's an individual case by case basis. Sometimes we'll uh, provide uh, uh, drugs, uh, you know, uh, cardio, uh, cardiovascular drugs to, to help with the heart. Um, uh, but it is just dependent upon what is, is uh, there. And you say, well, what about uh, uh, reduced um, drugs like uh, Lipitor? Uh, well, that's been used. That's been that's been investigated, but there uh, doesn't seem to be uh, at this point um, uh, uh, a lot of um, treatment response uh, or being able to uh, get the levels of that in the bird uh, that it will be therapeutic to be effective. So um, it's uh, still, still uh, right now, it doesn't appear to be that effective but uh, there has been uh, some uh, investigation in that and in, in possibly statins. And that's what the classification of those drugs are called, statins, that we could look for uh, possibly to use in the future. So there you go. All right. Uh, next question is about an umbrella cockatoo with reproductive issues. So she's been on Lupron and had... Uh, has had four implants. Um, so they're concerned about the negative effects of the treatments. Um, any suggestions on how to, to stop the egg laying? So the negative effects of the Lupron? Of the treatments, yeah. So I would assume the um the Lupron and the four implants. Um they want to know if you have any suggestions to stop the egg laying. No, that's um <clears throat> the only other the only other suggestion is a, a salpingo hysterectomy or removal uh, of the uh, reproductive tract. Um, and that is not a guarantee that it'll stop uh, ovulating. Um, it won't lay eggs because it will not lay eggs because you do not have a reproductive tract to go to the cloaca uh, and uh, your ideal area of the cloaca. And so it won't, it will not lay eggs but it will ovulate within the body. Now that is in most uh, uh, parrot cockatoo species uh, that uh, you probably have a five to 10% chance of that ha happening and it has happened. But for the most part, when you remove that um, oviduct uh, from the cockatoo, 
uh, and, and parrots, uh, cockatiels, uh, they do not ovulate, okay? Ducks will, other birds will, um, but uh, in 90% of the cases, and I'm just gonna use that as a conservative over history looking and listening, uh, people may say, if anything, it would be higher uh, that it would not ovulate, but I just want to be a little bit conservative. Uh, I don't like surprises, uh, for any owner. And I always just, uh, uh, say about, uh, you know, you have 90% chance most people would take that, you know, yes. but uh, if it still ovulates, then we will have to go back to the Desilorella and implants. Right. So, um, but that's that's the only other other thing they can do. There's nothing that I'm aware of as far as uh, behavior or light or anything like that environment for a cockatoo to stop uh, the egg laying behavior other than the Desiril and implants. Uh, I know there's uh, some other hormonal therapy that's been um, really uh, that would be uh, effective, uh, but uh has been dismissed uh due to uh adverse side effects and so i think that that's taken out of the the, the uh the area but uh we can always hope that we can uh find uh, new and better treatments uh for this in the future um yeah there you go all right um oh this is interesting i don't know if you've ever had this question before, or a question like this before. Um, they want to know if the presence of pigments like in the skin and feathers and birds, um, it, how much it changes as they get older. So for example, their Nande's feet used to be dark gray and now it's faded to a very light pink. Um, the scent her uh, or their Senegal, uh, their chest feathers um, on the other hand have, have gotten dark, deepened in color. They are light yellow uh, when they got her, but now they're a deep orange uh, bordering on red, bordering on red. So both are over 30 years old and these changes have occurred gradually um, over the 24 years or ago since I got, so they've had them for 24 years, they're 30 years old. Um, but is that something that's uh, that's normal and expected is kind of a change in pigment on skin, like or on the feet and in the feathering? I mean, I know like you tell, well, yellow heads get more yellow. <laughs> the Amazon, like, that one's enough. That one's yeah, easy. yeah. And, and uh and and i would say that uh for the most part uh there is uh, i just see as the animal ages um uh and not in in in, in some uh, just like and i always like to to kind of uh, correlate with humans uh it's like uh you know you see people and and you go like um and and this is you see people and you go like gosh you look so good. You have an age to bit. And then others you don't say anything to because they have aged and, and it's a different and different things affect that. But at the same time, and it's the same, same with your, your parents, each one's individual. But if, uh, you know, the, uh, if they've been under a, uh, uh, a quality of care, and uh, and you said the cynical thirty, yeah, and and it's it's like that is that is a that's a that's an older uh, cynical, and and with that, uh, that you could expect that you're going to have uh, change, uh, in coloration to some extent, and that it is possible. Some you may have more. Others you may have less, um, but uh, that is uh, that that occurs. You may have different color feathers coming uh, in places that wow, I've never seen a feather like that uh, uh, color uh, in that. But it's not that it's a disease process. That's uh, more than an aging process. It's one of the things that I look at. Well, Doc, I don't really know how old this bird is, but that is a, uh, a feather condition and feather coloring uh, is something that I look for to look for more of a geriatric patient. Uh, and so I look at uh, uh, lens 
the lens of, of birds. I look at the lens. And so, you, you know, cataracts, uh, that is a, a, a common denominator for old animals, including humans. So I look for, for lens opacities and older parrots will have that. Of course, as I mentioned, there's a number of things that can cause lens opacities, but the number one is, is older, uh, old age. And then uh, also skin. The skin is not as supple or tight in birds like humans uh, when they age. And then uh, also the, the feather uh, architecture, the, how the feathers look and the coloration of the feathers. So those are about three criteria that I look at in, in, in for uh, older, older birds. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're uh, on their way out by any stretch of the imagination. That means that they've lived uh, a good number of years, a good life, and have many more to look forward to, but we know generally how old they are. Okay. So, yeah, good Maybe, question. Yeah. That, that, that's why we have, uh, that's why Lefebvre has the senior bird nutriberries, right? It's given those extra nutrients in their golden years. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Supplementation doesn't, doesn't hurt uh, on, on uh, older birds uh, either. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because uh, human side, our hair probably gets technically lighter going gray, but so in this birds, uh, the Senate way, is it the, yeah, the, 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 uh, Senegal's case, it got darker and more. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, it, it, the, the coloration, it wasn't as light. And um, of course, uh, there can be other uh, effects. It just, uh, you know, well, we change diets or something else. Or it's eating something like that. But uh, that it can, it can, uh, you know, you can have like, you know, it can become darker. Uh, uh, in coloration. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we have a conure question for you. Um, it's a green cheek conure that's approximately one and a half, two years old, so youngin. Um, have they've had the have had her for a year, and she recently started nipping and biting. Um, so they've had many changes. They moved six weeks ago and upgraded her cage, and she was good for the first couple of weeks, but has been acting more aggressive these last couple of weeks. She's also a, gets aggressive when they try to, op, uh, to open her cage. Um, they want to know what they could do to, to, to correct the behavior, you know, before it becomes, I guess, um, you know, uh, everyday occurrence. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now the baby phase, right? The, 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 the conure fits a, a year and a half to two years. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 uh, <clears throat> I guess uh, the, uh, the, uh, they mentioned that there's been um, quite a bit going on with the bird uh, in their in the general flock itself, uh, moving and and going uh, at, at different places, um, and uh, kind of affecting its its uh, its its uh, it, its its place in the in the world, and and so. That I think that that uncertainty. I, I don't um, know uh, if there's anything that, uh, in particular, that may have uh, happened that would have uh, caused it to become a little bit more aggressive. Now you know there's aggressive, and then there's aggressive. We know <laughs> there's there's two different different uh, forms of that uh, mm -hmm. from the nip to the I want to bite your finger off you know yeah. and so I, uh, I I would hope that we're kind of at the nippy stage here and 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 uh, again uh, when when I you know I see something like this I always say I look to uh, you know I go into the uh, operant behavior uh, and and I'm going to uh, and I'm going to be the first to admit I'm not a, a veterinary behaviorist. I'm far from it. Uh, I know my limitations and and uh, and can kind of work through uh, treatment uh, that are, are based on 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 experience, and that's what my my recommendation is. Um, uh, on questions like this, I always say uh, I know 
uh, Laura, that we have um, different uh, webinars and information in the Lefebvre Library that, that kind of work and deal with these type of uh, situations possibly with uh, some of the behavior issues that, that, that come up with uh, a biting bird or something like that. But um, uh, that, that it's possible in there or uh, uh, a behaviorist, uh, a recommended behaviorist. Um, but uh, with that said, uh, I, I, I firmly believe in the operant conditioning uh, where uh, you reward uh, a, a bird uh, that is, uh, does what you want it to with a treat uh, that is specifically uh, held back. The bird loves it, but it's held back for good behavior. It doesn't get it any other time and it loves it. And so uh, in, in doing that um, and, and rewarding and then making, you know, and if the bird is uh, nipping or biting, <clears throat> then, then in, 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 in a, in a, in, you know, uh, let the bird know uh, in, 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 a, in a manner that, uh, that the bird is it's not like, you know, that is not, uh, they, they have a feel for your tone and you don't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be yelling at the bird or anything like that, but they know when, oh, you're such a nice little bird. I love you so much. You know, they know that is good. And no, I don't, that is not, you know, that is not good. I don't want you biting me. You don't have to raise your voice, but they know the difference in inflection. And again, like I say, that's why birds pick up expletives so much. They know when you say an expletive that it comes from the core. And it's like, boy, that makes that that's impactful, you know. And the other other terms is, well, I'll learn them when I want to, but I want to really learn those because they say it with feeling. But yeah. you know, birds can pick that up and and uh, so reward the good and let them know that, you know, they're not getting a reward, uh, but that that is not what you want them to do. And you will find, I think, that in general, that the bird will, will respond out of that. And also stability, stability within the environment, because the rationale of why everything's happening, the bird doesn't understand. It just knows that its world has been upside down, turned upside down. And it's just like, nobody listening to me, you know? And so, you know, taking it out. Uh, and this is just anthropomorphizing, but that's, you have to try to, to get an idea of what that bird is thinking uh, just to try to, to resolve the problem. So you can, you can, you know, stabilization for humans as well as birds is, um, is, is good. And so possibly with things maybe settling down that that would be helpful, but also working to reward the good is also something that will help expedite the process. Okay, all right. Uh, I got a hormone question for you. Um, let's see. Uh, this is about two bonded adult males. One's about 20 years old and the other is about eight years old. With so the the bonded males? Yeah, bonded adult males uh, is what they're saying. And um, the onset of hormones this year have started feeding each other and it appears that it is the older male feeding the younger male but it appears that the younger cockatiels demanding food from the older cockatiels. So we're talking about cockatiels. Um, besides separating them, is there any way to control this regurgitation type behavior? No, I don't, this, this, this no that's a, that's a, is that that's a good, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're friends. And, and I mean, I, uh, uh, it's, it's a, um, yeah, a behavior uh, that's uh, just, uh, it's not uh, what I would call, uh, say, uh, as far as uh, for their health, uh, 
uh, problematic. Uh, so uh, other than separation, uh, I don't see uh, how this, uh, you know, I, I don't have any recommendation uh, to try to uh, uh, resolve that. Um, you, you know, that, that would be, uh, I think worthwhile, you know, I mean, it's like, I don't know, oh, well, you can put another bird in there, you know, say, Ooh, look who's here, you know, <laughs> but I'm not recommending that. I mean, there are things that you can do, uh, possibly, uh, you know, you could say, well, you could get a, uh, you know, and anything that I recommend is like, well, it's a, uh, you know, it may work, but there's, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have any evidence that it will, uh, but you could change the environment somehow in the cage, you know, change the perches around where you feed it, uh, uh, you know, feed the birds or what have you, get a different cage, put it in a different location. Uh, that you can try, uh, but they'll still be in there together and they'll go, feed me. <laughs> I mean, so like the... <laughs> <laughs> See, if, if ever, I mean, can excessive trying to feed another excessively could that cause any any health issues? Ah, like, uh, you know, like birds eating it and constantly I, bringing it know. up in their crop, and here you go. No, yeah, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. That's, right. but yeah. All right, let's. Uh, let's question. I liked it. I, I liked like it. it. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um someone wants to know at what at what age do you consider a macaw old so they've had dog cats turtles but they never had a bird and they're learning um so glad to see you here and i it says that they've had uh they've had the macaw for a year now but it's about 30 years old or so um and they want to know what temperature it, they also want to know what temperature is uh comfortable for a blue and gold macaw um when does the macaw become considered old uh, a senior see the scene, so to speak, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and like comfortable it. temperature for a blue and gold macaw. <laughs> well, um, you know, from from what I can recall from Parrot Jungle uh, that had macaws for 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 many years, and then I'd have to to uh, uh, confirm this with the good Dr. Susan Club down in Loxtahatchee, um, that that uh what they found is that the the average lifespan of their macaws i think was about 45 to 50 years and uh and and of course started showing signs of older age that's the average lifespan now and then again we've already discussed that about what average is um but some can live longer and some of course can live shorter so uh i would consider uh uh your your bird uh at this time at, at uh kind of he said 30 years old mm -hmm. well yeah, in the middle about 30 yeah or 30, 30 yeah 30, well in the middle age yeah mm -hmm. so and then you say well what do you consider old i'd say over 40 uh oh, old okay. if, if they're if they're uh, uh been been uh they don't have any any uh health issues uh or um uh they've been raised in a good good environment that uh okay. that would be that would what i'd be considered for uh until then middle age middle age okay yeah uh, and also about the temperature so what um uh temperature the, yeah. I, I would say uh what's comfortable for us is a, a good temperature and as i've always i've, I've always mentioned Heat is the enemy of birds. Uh, they can't dissipate heat. Uh, they can uh, they can accommodate to cold much better than heat. Uh, and so, uh, what's what's comfortable for us uh, is is comfortable uh, for the bird. Uh, so, if you have a bird outside, you surely don't want him in the sun uh, when it's uh, ninety degrees or what have you. Uh, outside, uh, you want to make sure that there's a shade and that there, there there's some kind of a breeze uh, mm -hmm. fan, what have you, uh, or uh, you know shade for sure. Um, 
uh, on that, especially if you're in a higher humidity area. But um, <clears throat> and then that that's uh, that's what you're looking at. And then, of course, if you go into uh, you know cooler temperatures, it can go you know cooler, and a bird accommodates. Uh, mm -hmm. They can even be out in uh, uh, 32 degree weather if they've been uh, uh, accommodating and they've been acclimatizing over the fall. Uh, you surely wouldn't want to put a bird that hadn't been acclimatizing out in January or something like that, where it's 32 degrees, and you won't, you don't want it. You want the bird protected in those type of situations, but you probably have the bird inside. But I'm just talking about some aviary birds and things like that. But uh, nonetheless, if it's 70 degrees, uh, you know, then you're good. Okay, uh, question about budgie. Um, 10 years, uh, they don't know the exact age, but approximately 10 years old. Uh, she's been clinging to the side of the cage more and standing prone with the tail up. Um, they took her to the vet and had her x-rayed thinking she might be um, egg bound, but the x-ray didn't show any egg forming. Uh, the vet said uh, they'd have to do more extensive blood work, et cetera, to see what the problem might be. Um, is it advisable to put, they don't, they want to know if it's advisable to keep putting her through more stress. I imagine like the stress of the vet visits and, and all that. Um, and what, what may her symptoms suggest? She's been eating active free flies daily with a, with her cockatiel friend. I love that cockatiel friend. Um, so why would the budgie be cleaning the cage um, more and standing from with the tail up? What's your... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, it, that's a good question. Um, what I would, uh, you know, look at, uh, here is, is that, is that problematic? Is it just like a, uh, a behavior that the bird's just doing now and not associated any, you know, with any, uh, disease condition? Um, What's interesting is that, uh, you know, I always, 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 um, you know, uh, kind of in, in situations, uh, you know, you know, most people have symptoms, uh, you, know, you know, birds and animals don't have symptoms. Um, uh, they have clinical signs mm. um, because, uh, uh, and so, uh, and so you say, well, what's the difference? Uh, um, a symptom, they say medically is subjective. You know, uh, I have a, a a tummy ache. I have a a, a headache. Uh, I don't feel well. Uh, but a clinical side. So we we don't know if a bird has a headache. We don't know if they have a tummy ache, which are symptoms. Uh, clinical signs are actually, and then also it's descriptive. You know, well, what are your symptoms? So you're describing what you're your, your, your have not necessarily what is, is seen. And so we only can determine what is seen. And so you're describing objective, uh, things like, so a clinical sign would be, oh, it's, 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 it's limping. It has nasal discharge, uh, a runny nose. It's clinging to the side of the cage with its tail up. So I just, uh, you know, that's just, uh, just some information there. Uh, but, and that's what we go on. We go on uh, the clinical signs uh, of our patients. Uh, and so what I, I look at, and, and, and you have to remember as far as diagnostic testing, and you're talking about getting uh, uh, any kind of samples, you have a 30 gram bird. You know, I've, I've, I've heard of some 50 gram budgies and maybe more, but, you know, you're looking at a budgie weighing 30 grams, you know, or to maybe 35 on average. And so how much blood can you get from a 35 gram budgie? You know, not much. You can get 0.35 mils on a healthy budgie. And so, and so there's not many tests you can run on it, you know, or, or, or submit uh, for that. So what, you know, you know, why is it doing that? Did they take uh, uh, radiographs on this little budgie and they didn't see anything? I yeah, think. I thought it might have been egg, egg bound, being egg bound. Yeah, yeah, with the tail up, you could, you could, you could say that. 
Um, and so, you know, it sounds like, you know, doing well here, uh, you can do blood tests kind of, <clears throat> uh, it would have to be scheduled because you could not take so much blood, you know, to perform multiple tests, maybe one, one over a period of time. Uh, however, when we're looking at this, we have uh, in, uh, in, uh, kind of a positional issue where the, the bird is behaving like this, but it's free flighted and it flies with its little little friend, the cockatiel. Uh, the weight, you know, and when I look at the bird, I look to see uh, in situations like this, if there's any abnormalities any other things? Is it eating? Is it eating well? Is the stool normal? Is it defecating, urinating? Is its muscle, its body condition, its weight? Is that normal? Is there any other disease conditions that I see? Any other clinical signs of disease? If there's not, and I do not see anything in, in an old budgie palpating the 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 coelom and the abdomen to, to make sure that there's no enlargement of the liver or anything of that nature. And then you have the radiographic image, which is fantastic to look inside. Then at that point, and it's, and the only other test that I'd say is if, if I had to pick a test, blood test, a complete blood count, do the complete blood count, and you only have 0.35 mils to get a, a uh, to look and see if the inflammation, do we have any inflammation? Uh, and then you can, of course, look at the, the red blood cells to see if the bird's anemic, but it's flying around and that wouldn't be the case. But if you did that and there was no evidence of inflammation and you have the radiographic images, I would just say that it is a behavioral issue and, in, and keep you know, be observant like that. But if you see anything else, the birds start losing weight, it's behaviors differently, then bring it, bring it in. Sometimes diseases take time to develop. And so there may be something going on, but with the, the ability of us to make a diagnosis, that's, where it's not showing itself enough for the body to change for us to get that information. This happens with this happens with cancer a lot. If something's going on and we can't, nothing makes sense, then it's usually cancer. You know, if there's a a, a something really going on, because it can it, it can morph and hide and uh, because it's fooling the body, right? So I'm not saying that's what this is. I'm saying this is more likely not something, but you see a difference, but you look for, for any other changes that come down the line. Uh, and it may break out of the habit. It's flying, it's free flying. It's, it's you know, it's, it appears uh, from what you're saying in good, weight, body condition. So, so I think, uh, at this time, uh, to see if anything else, you know, if it gets worse or you have other disease, you know, it's, it, it's becomes more depressed. It doesn't fly like it used to, it loses weight. Then, then it would be time for, you know, more testing, but no, great question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. As yeah. all of them are. I know, right? So I love this, this these sessions because you never know. You never know what you're going get, to get asked. Um, no, no. Well, here's another question for you. Um, are there any supplements that you would recommend for an older parrot? So we're kind of, we kind of have a theme going today with the older parrot. We're doing older, older, a lot of older parrots. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good that, sign. That's that we have good, older parrots, right? <laughs> that's a great thing because birds are living long. That means that they're taking great care of them. And, uh, and, and, and the supplements that, and, and like I always say about supplements, um, uh, that, um, 
just to use them as as it is uh, recommended. Um, uh, and uh, the only the only thing is like if we're we're not talking about uh, probiotic supplements, that's a whole different story. But if you're looking at vitamin and mineral supplements, just mm -hmm. use them uh, as is directed on the product. And uh, Lefebvre has a uh, of course, I am going to uh, uh, give the name of the Lefebvre product uh, because they have Vivi 13, uh, the vitamin supplementation uh, as far as a supplement. And then uh, the Necton products uh, is another supplement, a uh, vitamin supplement, uh, Necton S. And then they have a variation of vitamin products uh, uh, for feathers and different things for uh, birds. But uh, I think that uh, along with the diversified diet as we've talked about with the pelleted supplement as a basis for that mm -hmm. um, will provide uh, the nutrition that the bird needs to, uh, to continue living through, through older age. Uh, and 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 because we don't know what the in many of these the recommended daily nutritional requirements are for these animals, that the supplementation and the diversification helps give us a better chance of uh, meeting those uh, nutritional requirements on a daily basis. Okay, um, let's see. I, I, guess what? We're already we're already uh, past the one o'clock or the. One hour mark here. <laughs> Quite good. Well, we were we were having fun, right? Yes, and learning and learning a lot. Learning, right. Yes, great questions from a great great webinar group. Yeah. Um, so so wait, I got to make an uh, our giveaway. I got I got to announce our giveaway winner for today. Um, and that is drum roll, please. But that is going out to Heidi Carla. Congratulations, Heidi. Um, you're going to get a pack of, or a bag of the Lefebvre pellets so you can see my there we go the 50th anniversary we're celebrating this diet yeah, uh, yeah. as well as well as another um choice of uh, fever product of your choice so someone in the Libra, Libra office will reach out to you um via email and get that going to you so congratulations um and if we didn't get to your question today um which i, I think we got through a bunch that uh, a lot that came through we, we we got through the pipeline which is awesome um We'll, 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 we'll try to send you an answer via email. So, um, and maybe we'll, I mean, and if maybe we can even say one for the next time, cause we're going to see. Yes. Yes. Uh, right? Yeah. Lead off, a lead off question. Lead right off, off of that. Yes. All right. I love um, that. Well, but fantastic questions from the, the group, a uh, great, great, uh, webinar group and, uh, learn every time, uh, all the time. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, so just a sneak preview, uh, our next webinar will be June. So June 9th. Um, and that is going to be with Lisa, Lisa Bono. Um, she's actually behind the scenes today, um, doing the, the chat, uh, and, and the questions, uh, in, in, in lieu of Brenda's, um, filling Thank you, Brenda. Lisa. So, good job, Lisa. <laughs> um, and, uh, so Lisa's going to be on with us on June 9th. Uh, I hope you know this, Lisa, but, uh, if you don't, here, I'm going to remind you June 9th, um, she's going to cover the gray way episode is going to be about my bird wants that, but does my, does my bird need that? So, um, <laughs> I love this. I love this. Uh, so yeah, she's going to talk about pet bird products and foods that aren't in the best interest of your bird, perhaps. Um, yeah, I could go through some of my Amazon listings and just some stuff I see for birds that are kind of, hmm. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Shopping online is you never know. Uh, you got to have a trusted source, I guess, is what takeaway would be on that too. Um, all right. <laughs> on, on that note, um, I'm going to wish, uh, I, well, I'll see you back in June, Dr. Tolley, uh, mid-June. And so the end of June, the end of the month, you're going to be in the middle of the month. So there you go. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Just looking forward to it on uh, the 16th, I believe. Yep, June 16th. And uh, look it's forward like our, to some more good questions, great questions. That is, yeah, absolutely. It's like our 35th, I don't know, you've done so many of these. I, I think we're in like the 30s now. Like, I think you literally have done like over 30 webinars. With us. And we haven't even scratched the surface of all the questions that I know our, our, our attendees, you know, our webinar uh, yeah. group can ask. So, yeah, so, we got to do another um, stump the vet one though. I like when, uh, like if someone come with a really. <laughs> oh yeah, they'll stop, they can stop me. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, 
there it is. You've stumped me. Then I will have to answer you, and then, then we'll get it the next time. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, I'll good. do some research there. So, so very all right. good. All, all right. right. <laughs> Thank you. On that note, everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you and your flock, and everyone stay safe. Till next time. Bye, Doc. Uh, bye, thank you. bye, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.